Hello, hello everyone. It is Jackie from Pocket of Preschool and I am coming to you live today to talk all about um, some, some of my favorite classroom management tips that have really helped and changed the behavior um, in my classroom. So go ahead and drop in the comments for me um, what your something that is working really well for you for classroom management or maybe something that you're struggling with. So at the top of this post, you will see a link for the handout. It's like a three page um, PDF and it has links to everything. So everything I'm going to talk to you today, talk about today um, is in the link. So there's link to blog posts and past Facebook lives, all the things, because I'm going to be telling you guys so many things. So the handouts will be perfect for you guys to use um, if you want more information on any little piece of this. So classroom management is probably the hardest thing I think about being a teacher, like dealing with all the problem behaviors and just managing all aspects of the classroom. And I think in college, this was one thing I really didn't, like there's what, like one little itty bitty class on it. Um, I luckily had amazing um, student teachings and all of that. So I was really fortunate. Um, but a lot of this you kind of have to like learn as you go, right? Different kids need different things um, and different classes, different need different things. So one of my most go-to favorite things for classroom management is you need some kind of like system. And so you can see, whoops, backwards. My system I use is green and red choices. And you guys, it is hands down the best thing I've ever implemented or made um, for my classroom ever. Like it is the best. It, what it is, is, is a universal support for all students um, so they can learn and support their social um, emotional development in the classroom. It teaches students the expected behavior, so what we want them to do, right? And you can use this at home. You can make little charts and you can they, for families to use at home. They can use this in school, and hopefully they can then take it out to, outside and use it um, in the school environment um, or the community too, right? Because we want um, we want really awesome little learners everywhere they go, right? Not just in our classroom. So hopefully once they learn in our classroom, then they can transfer it and do it um, outside in the um, community. And then like, you know, like when they're at Target <laughs> um, and all the different places. Um, and the, so my green and red choices is literally, you guys, it is by far the top seller of anything I've ever made um, on TPT in my store. So I know you guys, I know this works in your classrooms too, and it is just, it's such a great visual reinforcer. And it also takes the choice. It's not a good and bad choice. It is, is it a green choice or is it a red choice? So it takes the whole um, behavior off of the child. It's not, oh, you made a bad choice. You're a bad kid. Because that's what they kind of think, right? When we say, oh, that's a bad choice, then they kind of internalize it and think that they're bad. And it's not. They just made a bad choice. But you know what? When you say, oh, that's a red choice, can you change it and make that into a green choice? What could you do? Um, oh, you can use your walking feet? That's great. Oh my gosh, I love those walking feet. Great job making a green choice. It takes the positive and the negative off of them. It being like they're a bad kid, they're a good kid. It just makes it into just another part of the day or something that they do, not actually them. So it's just, it's clear expectations. They're almost always in a positive. Um, I always make my green choice bigger than my red choice. I do at the beginning of the year start off with not as many green choices and not as many red choices just so it's not overwhelming. I do the ones that you really need. I also keep them on a necklace so that way if I'm around in the classroom or if I'm in the hallway or on the playground, I can be like, oh, Oh, remember a green choice. We use our gentle hands with our friends because you know kids get so excited and they just put their hands on each other. Not that they're being mean, they're just excited and they don't know what to do with that big feeling. Um, so using gentle hands. Um, another one I like to keep um, on my little necklace. And this comes in the green and red choice pack. It's an entire printable set on TBT. It comes with Tons and tons of choice cards that there's so many you will never need them, but different years you have different kiddos and you have different behaviors. So you'll um, put the behaviors up that you're seeing and it may change throughout the year too and that is okay. Um, there is also a parent note. There are sticker charts in here. There's little, um, like I made green choices, little like um, like awards or a little like pat on the back type little note you can send home. Um, if your kids need that, if they don't, kind of use what works for you in it. I've never used the sticker charts in my classroom. Um, 
because I am more of a natural consequence kind of teacher. But if your kiddos need that this year, or if you are a sticker chart kind of teacher, those are in there for you to use. There are individual um, little plans. So you can kind of send that home um, and let families know like how many green and how many red choices they made. This is like a little communication system. I've used that only for individual kiddos. And I always make that super, super private. I keep it on a little clipboard in their cubby. And it's just a discussion between me and that individual kiddo, because obviously we don't want to um, broadcast or shame a child for a behavior because they're just expressing what they're feeling on the inside. And it's not, and it's just like anything else we teach, right? We have to teach behavior just like we have to teach letters and sounds and counting and all of that. So um, it's it's just like a little system that you want to keep private with that one little kiddo. So you're not telling the whole class about all the red choices they made um, or all the green choices. It's just a little private conversation with you and that kiddo. And again, I've only used that with certain kids who need that extra step. I'd never do it full class. Um, so yeah, so if somebody is asking if this can be used, green and red choices can be used in kindergarten, and it absolutely can. I know we have a Facebook group, the Pocket of Preschool Facebook group. So if you wanna see how people are using green and red choices in their individual classrooms in different settings, you can hop over there, put green and red choices in the search bar, and you can see how different teachers are using it and implementing it. Um, I also have an entire Facebook Live, an hour-long Facebook Live on how to implement Green and Red Choices in your classroom, and I have a whole blog post on it, too, and all the links are in that handout for you guys. Um, but again, it's just expectations, what we want them to do, stated in a positive and clear way. Um, you can also make a smaller chart, um, and I literally just put the, a red piece of paper and a green piece of paper. Oh, I'm backwards on the camera. Sorry, guys. And then I keep extra choices on the back that I might need. And then I just have Velcro on here. So I can just take one off and put one on as I need it. Um, this is perfect for small group. Um, also, I know somebody said they are struggling with small group. Um, there is a book that comes with it. And at, before you start small group, you or table time or maybe circle, um, you can say, you know what? During small group today, we are going to um, really work hard on taking turns. So we're going to play a math game today, and everyone is going to take turns. Um, so you can just kind of point that out to the kiddos, that this is what we're working on today. And it's also a visual reminder, and you're also telling them, so they can hear it and see it, that they are going to take turns. So that's kind of the expectation. So that way, when they go to do small group, they're going to know going into it, like, I'm going to have to take turns so they can kind of prepare. And it's just a nice reminder of what they what they need to do, what you want them to do um, during that activity. And there's a bunch in here. All the green and red choices have this. Um, so if you are getting ready to go in the hallway, you can say, okay, friends, we are going to go in the hallway to, um, it's raining at my house today. So um, we're going to use our walking feet and we're going to go down the hallway to the gross motor room. So remember, in the hallway, we use our walking feet. You can give them this visual. Now they can see it and hear what they want to do. And then you can go in the hallway because we want to remind them of what we want them to do before the behavior occurs, right? So if you know that the hallway is hard, or if you know during small group, it's really hard for them to keep their hands to themselves because they get so excited and they're just touching their friends. You can say, okay, during small group, stay friends. We are going to work really hard. And even though we are so excited about this activity, we're going to keep our, we're going to use gentle hands and we're going to keep them to ourselves. So again, it just gives them that visual and that reminder, and then they can proceed with the group and then you have it. You can remind them as needed. And eventually like during circle and things like by I would say a couple months in, um, I can just point to the green choices or point to a card or just literally show this on my necklace. And kiddos, it's a visual cue and they know they need to fix their choice, right? They need to fix their behavior. Um, and it's it's really, really helpful um, for kiddos. Um, so yeah, so that's green and red choices. So that's a system. So whatever behavior system you're going to use, you want to teach it and you want to use it consistently all year because Consistency is huge with kiddos. Now we're going to kind of talk about the classroom environment. So the environment plays a huge, huge role on your classroom behaviors because, right, it's kind of like your house. It's where they're at for the majority of the day. And it, your classroom environment can either increase student behaviors or it can decrease student behaviors. So I'm going to tell you some things you can do to decrease those student behaviors. 
um, or the, the behaviors we don't want to see, right? And I will also say, if you are having a kiddo who is consistently making red choices and they're, those are some, they're having like huge emotions and they're having huge tantrums, you're having to evacuate the room, um, they're, it's not safe for you or other kiddos, you really need to have a conversation with that family and your admin so that way you guys can make a plan together because if they're experiencing huge behaviors, there's more that's going on this um, behavior system, it will work for them, but they're going to need other things in place because their behavior is just, it's more intense. So sometimes um, you are going to need a little bit more support for those um, individuals who are having those a lot bigger behaviors, right? And I also wanted to remind you guys that since we have been isolated for so long with COVID, these group of kiddos we have, they don't even have memories pre-COVID. So they are coming to us without having time to practice all of those social skills that they used to, right? They used to go to Target and the grocery store. They used to have to wait in line. They used to have to wait at the restaurant to order. They used to have to, um, they would see their moms and dads expressing their wants and needs. Like, I need more water um, and ask their, their um, server for more water at the restaurant. They would wait and get their check. Um you know, just all of those social opportunities that kiddos would practice and the, see their families or whatever, whoever their caregiver is practice when they're out and about in the world, all of those opportunities have kind of been taken away from them. So all of those practice times, now they're going to have to do them in your classroom. So you're going to have to set them up for success and give them those reminders like, um, and give them visuals because all of those experiences are gone. Like playgrounds were taken away. They, a lot of, I hear a lot of teachers saying like, my kids don't know how to play. They don't know how to interact with each other. They don't know how to share. And they, they probably don't because they haven't had those experiences. They've been at home with mom and dad or grandma and grandpa or whoever. Um, and they're maybe now working from home. And that is a whole new set of challenges for that family. So they might just be in like survival mode, right? Like we're just going to try and make it until tomorrow. So those kiddos are probably getting a lot more screen time, a lot more, a lot less interaction. They may not even be having family gatherings, or maybe they didn't for a long period of time um, for health, for health reasons. Um, so we're going to have to put all of this into our day and you guys, we can do it. It's just, it's just the kiddos are going to look different and, they're going to look different for a couple more years because they, the kiddos who are babies, they were isolated. The kiddos who were toddlers, they have been isolated. So we are going to see the kiddos coming in to us different for the next couple of years. And we're just going to have to put some extra systems in place um, to help those kiddos so they can be successful um, in the next grade or in our classroom, right? So now let's talk about classroom environment. I didn't want to um, forget to tell you guys that part. Um, so the goal of the classroom environment, right, was we want to put supports in place so that way they can be independent and develop and build social skills as much as possible, right? We know when they're coming in at three or maybe the kinders are coming in and they're coming in. They kind of look like preschoolers, right, because they haven't had all of those experiences and be able to be able to build all those social skills. So wherever you're getting your kiddos, they probably need more help than they typically would in a year. So we're going to put some things in place so that they can be successful in the classroom. So one of the things is to put less things on your shelf. So your shelves, you guys, they do not have to be packed full with toy, 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 or activity or like so many manipulatives. Take some of the stuff off of your shelves. If you are having like... In my center or in my classroom, blocks was always a mess and pretend or dramatic play was always a mess. Those were the two centers that um, would be the biggest mess or just the most, you know, just everything on the floor. Um, so if you see somewhere that's like a hot mess, <laughs> um, what, look at that center or look at that station where, wherever they're at and say, how can I change the environment so that this um, stops happening or it occurs less. So what one thing you can do is literally have less things on your shelves, right? They don't have to be packed full. If you have puzzles, maybe just put two floor puzzles out. It doesn't have to be full to the brim. If you have pig puzzles, only put three pig puzzles out um, instead of having them totally, totally full. Um, so things like that. You Maybe instead of having your tubs all the way full, just have them half full. So I have my 
This is my Play-Doh bucket of supplies. So I, you guys, can you see it? It's only about, oh, half full. So I have some cookie cutters in here. I have some, these are like lemon squeezers, but they're fun with Play-Doh. Um, some cupcake liners. And then I have some shape cards so they can make those. But you guys, this is not super full because they do not need that much stuff for them to have um, a, a fun <laughs> and um, fabulous play experience. Because there are tons and tons of fine motor things in here that they can use to develop those fine motor skills. Um, they don't need it to be over full or like over full. So if you have animals and blocks, you don't need every animal from your back closet in the block center. Maybe just put out the zoo animals or just put out the ocean animals or just the farm animals and switch those out for each theme. Maybe you're only going to have 10 animals out for a while until they can learn how to use those materials appropriately and play with them so it's not overwhelming. Because I know our kids, they come in and they don't know how to play with others. And then they have so many so many things in, in, the, in our classrooms that are so, so exciting to play with. It's overwhelming. So put less stuff in your tubs. And then also, like if you have, like um, like for Play-Doh, I have my Play-Doh um, tools. And then the shelf underneath, I have the tray. So keep things that go together visually so the kids can see them. So that way they're like, oh, I'm going to grab the Play-Doh bucket. But, oh, I need a tray so I can play with my Play-Doh on the tray. Because if the tray was somewhere else, they, they may forget it, but if they can visually see it, oh, I have the Play-Doh bucket and I need a tray, they're together, and then they can grab both of those things. It's like a visual reminder in the environment. And then you also want to have labels. These are in my TBT store. I have a ton of them. I have the Play-Doh tools, and then what you're also going to do is you're going to put a, a um, the tools on the, on the outside of the tub, and then this is going to go on the shelf. So that way when they go play with this thing and they play on the carpet or they play at the table, um, that way this is on the shelf so they know to find this picture and it matches so they can find the picture and put it back in the right place. So now they can be independent during um, cleanup. Um, so I know some of you are saying for your standards or for your, um, what's it called? Your whatever system you use for evals or um, things that you have to have your shelves full and you do have to have stuff on your shelves. I'm not saying like, don't put anything out. Like my shelves are full, but like for floor puzzles, I usually only have two and that fills it up pretty good. Like for my letter locks, I only have half of the set or sometimes I do a third of the set on, there's the, see there's the label. I only have a half of the set or a third of the set out in the tub. So it looks like my shelves are full, but I don't have as much stuff in the bucket. So that way when it comes to cleanup or playing, they're not overwhelmed and they can play with it more appropriately because it's not so much and it's not overwhelming um, for them. So yes, you can have your shelves full, but you don't have to have as much stuff on each shelf. So if you have a shelf with sensory bottles, don't put out 12 put out four. Um, so it's less stuff, less overwhelming for your kiddos. And then once they learn um, how to move and um, play in your classroom environment, you can slowly put more stuff out on your, um, in, in addition to, um, to make it simulating for them. Um, but pr I promise they won't be bored if um, you have left stuff in the bins, promise. Um, and then you also want to have visual supports and routine charts for your students to use throughout the classroom. So on my art easel, where is it? For example, I have this visual. And then you also want to teach these routines. So I literally do a circle time lesson on how to use the art easel. And then I go over to the art easel and the whole class sits in front of the art easel and I model how to paint at the easel. And I use the book, um, I Ain't Gonna Paint No More. Um, and I actually have a free set of back to school lesson plans if you want to see kind of how I teach routines, you can grab that. The link is in that handout. Um, and if you haven't, if you don't have these routines out, it is never too late to put them out. So if you don't have an easel routine out or maybe um, a sensory table visual out, put it out now and teach that routine because it, even though it's not the beginning of the year, it is never too late to teach a routine, to teach um, an expected behavior or um, to, to reteach expectations because it's just like us, right? Like we need to be reminded how 
to teach different things, right? So kids need to be reminded how to um, use different things in our classrooms. And especially after holiday breaks, or maybe you have a new kiddo who comes in, it's the perfect time to reteach th those routines. So like, and also for your routines, you want them to have super simple text and super simple pictures. So my easel routine is put on a smock, get paper, write your name, or scribble it at this point in the year, right? When they all can't write their names yet. Um, create, and then put it on the drying rack. So that way, when they get over to the the the, um, the art easel, they don't go, okay, now what do I do? They can look at this picture and you've modeled it, say, okay, when I go to the art routine, I'm gonna look at this and this is gonna help me remember what to do. Oh, it says, get on my smock. I'm gonna get on my smock. And maybe you walk over there to the routine, um, to a kiddo who is at the art routine or at the art easel and say, oh, I see you have your smock on. Are you going to are you going to get paper next and point to your visual routine? So that way, if they see you using them, they're more likely to use them when they are playing um, in their classroom. And you can see I literally took this off my easel routine. There's even paint on it. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So or maybe they get to the create and they always leave it at the easel, right? You can say, oh, you know what, I know, and maybe that friend is now doing something else. You can walk them back over and say, oh, my gosh, I really love how you use the red in your painting. Oh, don't forget, we have to put our, our art on the drying rack so that our friends can use it next. And then they can put it on the drying rack, finish the routine, and then maybe next time when they are at the art easel, um, they will remember to do all of it or some of it. But that way, that is there just so they um, they can use it, too even when you're not there, right? Because that's our goal for them to be more independent um, in the classroom. Some other good places for visuals are in the bathroom, like go wipe flush, right? Like right by the toilet. Um, I usually have that one right by the toilet paper. Um, maybe your kiddos use a ton of toilet paper. You can put like a number five by it or something, like you take five pieces. Um, a hand washing is a great one to have by um, right by the sink. Is it going to get wet? Are you going to have to re probably remake it and laminate it halfway or at the end of the year? Probably. But now that visual is there so they can look at those pictures and see what to do next, right? Um, another one is great is if you have um, your um, expectations for the playground, you can either put them on the front of your door in your classroom or you can put them um, as a school. I know at our centers, I taught in a high school when I taught full day, so I always had it on the outside of our playground door. Um, but you, if you don't want that or your school doesn't want that, you can put it on the outside of your classroom door. So as you're lining up, you can say, okay, remember when we go on the playground, remember to keep the mulch on the ground. That was always huge. They We always had mulch throwers in my classroom for some reason. Remember to keep the mulch on the ground and feet first down the slide. So I, you can point because I would have it like on my door and I could point and give them two reminders. So that way I'm setting them up for success when they go to the playground. Um, so that's another thing you can do. And again, if you are having issues on the playground, bring in a book, find a book about playing on the playground and talk about, oh my gosh, how they, look at how safe these kids were in this book. They had so much fun on the playground. Let's talk about how we can be safe on our playground so that everybody can have fun and then have that visual routine out and just review it. And sometimes that's all it takes. Um, or you may have to do a small group on it with a couple um, kiddos who are struggling with that. Um, but it's always okay to remind or add in, oh, you can hear the lightning, <laughs> um, add in um, visuals wherever they're needed um, in your classroom. Because you know what, different classes need different things. Um, and if you see students struggling, um, you can, I have a ton and ton of visuals. Maybe they're having trouble lining up or they're having trouble with cleanup. You can go to my TPT store. I have tons of visuals. Search cleanup or whatever it is you're looking for. And if I don't have it, just search on TPT because I'm sure someone has it um, available for you. And you can use those visuals or you can just use Google Images or Clip Art and make your own too. Um, whatever you have time for and whatever works for you. But, um, but yeah, so that is a ton of ideas. Um, let's see. Let's keep going. So um, somebody asked, what do you do when you have a kiddo who is pinching or touching each other during circle time? Um, and you know what? That is perfect because we can totally, um, 
I was going to talk about this in a minute, but we're, we're going to go ahead and talk about it now. So one thing you can do um, is if you, let's say like um, she's having some behavior during circle time. So what I would do is I would look at my circle time and then say, is the length appropriate? Um, or is that kiddo searching for sensory? Um, think about your circle time. Who are they sitting by? Um, so one thing you can do for circle time is have everyone have their own like visual space, like a, their spots you can use. I know some teachers use sit spots. Um, I, you can use these um, from Lakeshore or wherever you can get some. So maybe you can give a, a kiddo this and maybe they're just needing some sensory. This is bumpy so they can play with this. They can sit on it and then kiddos who need that tactile input, that sensory input will play with this as they're sitting. Maybe they they can just have a koosh ball or something like that, and they can just have it in their hands, and they can be fiddling with that in their lap during circle. Um, on my circle, so everyone has can visually see. Again, it's all visual with preschoolers, guys. Um, I have a grid on my carpet, so I bought an art outdoor rug from Target one year on clearance, and then I literally put duct tape. I did horizontal lines and then vertical lines, and it literally makes a grid. So each kid has a square. You can also do carpet squares. So those kiddos visually see where their space is and where their friend's space is. So that way, <clears throat> maybe they're just in each other's space, and maybe you need to spread them out. Um, or maybe they're needing some sensory input. So again, you can give them a fidget or give them something to sit on. Um, some kiddos, I know play with my tape on the rug. So that tells me they're needing some sensory. So you can also maybe add in some movement and um, maybe shorten your circle time too. Maybe they're sitting too long for them. Um, so you can try all of those things. Um, I know um, visuals are great on the ground at places you line up. So I know some teachers, um, I have in past years, I have just put a piece of masking tape on the ground and it is okay if your like space to line up goes like in like weird ways because you have to go around furniture and things. But as long as you have that spot, then they can say, okay, everybody put your feet on the tape. So that tells me that you guys are ready to go outside. So everybody's in a line and they are um, ready to go outside. I've also, these are um, in my lineup. I have a whole um, pack on lineup and hallway if you need like a social story and visuals and songs and things. Um, but I put a line leader visual. I literally tape it to the floor at the, at the front of my line. And then right behind that, I have the door holder. So the door holder is right behind. And then at the very end, I have the caboose. Um, so that way they visually know where to stand. Um, I've also put a piece of tape on the ground where they wait to wash their hands. And I know that is a crazy time, right? Like they all have to wait in line to use the sink. So I just have some sensory bottles. In my old class, I had a shelf right there um, by where they waited. So I just put sensory bottles on that shelf. But um, in my classroom now, it's I don't. <laughs> There's just a wall. So I just have some sensory bottles along the wall so they can they visually can see where their feet need to be. So that's where they know to wait. And then they have a sensory bottle to play with and they can play with that sensory bottle. And then when it's their turn, they can go in and they can wash their hands. And then they have the visual schedule there. I also have like a number three on the paper towels or two, I can't remember. <laughs> um, so that way they know to get one or two paper towels. It's just a, another visual cue. Um, so yeah, so. Just visuals everywhere, visuals on the floor, visual routines. Um, you can see I have my circle time visuals up here. So um, when I'm doing circle time, I can say like quiet voice, look. And I just have look because they may, they may need to be looking at their friend who is talking or maybe they're sharing something with a friend so they can look at them or maybe they need to look at the book or maybe they need to look at me. Um, but just they need to be looking wherever. <gasps> Wherever it's important, right? Um, or maybe they need to be, you know, looking at the, the, the what I have on the board. Um, so I just have look and then raise your hand, um, learn, and then sit with your hands to yourself. And I also think this year we need to kind of pick our battles because as from COVID and just kiddos not being active as they have been in years past coming to us, they have weaker um, gross motor muscles and weaker fine motor muscles. So they may not be able to sit crisscross applesauce 
as long as they would in years past because they haven't developed those core muscles. So if if sitting crisscross applesauce isn't working for them, maybe they can sit on their bottom just with their legs out, or maybe they can sit with their their um, knees to their side. I mean, I wouldn't have them W sit um, because it's that's really bad for their knees and um, hips and things. Um, so no W sitting because that that will literally hurt their body. Um, but maybe they can sit with their legs to the side, or they can have they can use their arms to brace themselves. Um, so don't I think this year too we need to be more flexible with our expectations when we can be like sitting at circle. We don't have to they don't have to be little soldiers and they don't have to be sitting little perfect angels um, sitting crisscross applesauce. Let them sit in a way that's comfy for them. If they need one of these, if they need a cube chair, which cube chairs are expensive, but they are amazing. <laughs> um, I love them. And you can put them at the back for those kiddos who need them, or they can take turns sitting in them. Um, but kind of do um, let them be, give them choices when you can. I think in our day is, a lot, is really important this year. Um, and kind of not having the same expectations of, as we did years past, just because these kids are different. And they're going to be different for the next couple of years because of COVID and isolation. Um, so now that we've looked at our shelves, what's on the shelf, um, the visuals we're using, um, all that. Um, also look at your walls. So look at your walls. Do you have too much on the wall or do you have too little on the wall? Um, I like to have obviously things as low as I can. Um, like here's my linear calendar. Is it up a little high for me? Mm hmm. Yes, <laughs> I would rather have it a little bit lower, but the way my classroom is, um, it just isn't feasible. I do have it low enough to where they can use a, a pointer and they can um, point and help with calendar. And then these are also on Velcro so I can take it off. They can put an X on it and then I can put it back. Um, so having things low, not having too much on your walls. Um, again, these kids are coming in different is like just take an honest reflection of your classroom. Is this working for kiddos this year or is it not? Um, and you could be a first-year teacher, a second-year teacher. You could be like me and have taught for 15 years. But look at your classroom. Like, what can I change to, that would help these kiddos this year? Can you add it later? Absolutely. Can you take something down, put something else up, see if it works? And if it doesn't work, try something different? Absolutely. Um, you just got to kind of figure out and observe what's bothering your kiddos, what isn't when look at when they're having behaviors in your schedule um another thing is that's really important is to have i have it behind me <laughs> um this is my little chair i sit at at circle have the visual schedule you can take it off um okay say okay we are all done with snack now it is oh i have two circles now it is time for circle and then after circle we are going to do centers um so that way they know what's coming next Visual schedule is so, so important. And yours, you may have, I have visual schedules in my TBT store that have real photos in them. So if you want real photos, I have that in my TBT store for you. Um, or you can make one that's your own. You can take pictures of your classroom and your students doing things um, and then make that into a visual schedule. You make one however you want, but it's really, really important to have one so students know what is coming next. Um, and what, so that way they can kind of anticipate because we as adults like to know what's coming next, right? Um, kids thrive on routine. The more routines you can have, the better your classroom will be. Um, so they know what to expect. They know what is coming. Everything looks the same. Are you going to have different lessons? Absolutely. You'd have different stuff on yourself sometimes. Totally. Got to keep them engaged and got to keep rotating things. Um, are you going to do different things for a small group? Totally. But you know, the small group will have the same expectations. Playground will have the same expectations. Circle time, they need to, um, it'll always look the same um, and things like that. So just consistency is huge. And again, look, I have all my notes. I'm reading right from them. Um, so I have a whole Facebook Live all about my morning routine. Um, and again, the link is in the handout because I know I'm telling you guys links to all these different, all these different pieces. So the routine. So right when your kiddos come in, you want them to know what to do. So even I even start um, my my morning routine on open house night, and um, 
They sign in during open house. They find their cubby. They answer the question of the day. So they find where different things are. So that way on the first day when we do the morning routine, they know kind of what to expect, where things are. And then on the first day of school, I have everyone literally, I just have them grab something out of their cubby. Um, and we literally, I have everybody sit right by the classroom door and we practice the morning routine. I model it first and then the kids all do it, you know, three or four at a time. So we come in, we say like bye to our moms and dads. They put their stuff away. They answer the question of the day. The question of the day starts on their cubby so they can visually see. It's a visual reminder of what that what to do next. Put their stuff away, grab their question of the day star, answer the question of the day, sign in, and then do table time. Um, so, and we literally practice it. Now, I do want to say, if you haven't practiced some of these routines yet or you're struggling with a routine, is it okay to practice them in October? in January, in March, totally is. If you have something that isn't working in your classroom or routine that students are having having trouble with, totally take one small group or one circle time and practice it. Because that one time, that may be all it takes for enough kiddos to get that routine down. So you now you have all these little models, right? You have these little peer models that are doing the right thing. They're going through the steps. So now they're friends. Instead of you having to remind them, um, either with a cue or um, by telling them, they can just look at their friend and see what their friend is doing and kind of follow that. Um, so they can just observe their friends. So use those kiddos who are leaders who um, who always, <laughs> there's always those kiddos, right, who know what's going on. They know all the routines. They have them down. Um, and it may be the older, a few older kiddos in your class because like I always had a mix of three, four, and five-year-olds. So I always depended on those five-year-olds to model those routines for my younger kiddos. So um, use those older kiddos as peer models, um, reteach routines. I have first day of school less or first week of school lesson plans. So you can see kind of how I do it. You can still totally do that in October or in December or whenever you're struggling or your or your class is struggling. Or maybe you have a new friend and you need to reteach that routine. Um, but Having solid routines um, and having your kiddos know those routines, one, they start learning the minute they walk in the door. It starts the day off on a positive note because you're not having to cue kids, tell them, okay, do this, do that, okay, do this, do that. You're not having to nag them, be annoying. <laughs> and they know what to do. So now you can focus on saying good morning, having a really positive interaction with them, and they can um, start playing or doing whatever the table time activity is. And so they're learning like right when they walk in the door, it starts the day off great. And it'll just, the ball, you can just keep that ball rolling all day long. Um, and again, I have a Facebook Live on it and the link is in the handout. Now, another thing that we need to do this year or always, but this year I think it's more important than ever is to teach problem solving strategies. Now, I usually wait a couple weeks until I teach problem solving strategies. And here is my, this is literally, hold on, let me find the magnet. Put it up here. Cover that up. Okay. So these are my problem solving techniques. Now I only introduce three or four a week. Um, and I have this in my center, um, but I, where are they? I only teach a couple of them a week. I actually have them on magnets. It's actually in my puppet bin. <laughs> um, and I literally teach them. So I may teach, usually the, the first ones I teach, they're the top row. So I'll teach wait, or sorry, say stop, say please stop, ask, get help, and say how you feel. Because a lot of problems can be so solved all of those ways. <laughs> Um, they can get help because a lot of kiddos, they will sit there. They don't know what to do. They're overwhelmed. Um, they're nervous. They're having big feelings. Um, so they don't know what to do. They need to ask for help. So you can say, oh, I see you're sitting there. Do you need something? Can you ask me for help? Or they can ask a peer for help. Um, now ask is when somebody has something that they want, right? Maybe they have their friend has the dinosaur they want to play with, so they can say, oh, can I have it? Teach them super simple language to go with each one, um, so that way they have that in their brain and they can just use that one. They don't have to think up something new every time they need to ask, can I have that? And then you also kind of need to teach the other end, like what to do when the friend says, no, I'm using that. Um, we have a stand timer in my classroom. It's a five-minute timer. 
It is not a timeout timer. <laughs> this is, um, we use this in my classroom so they to practice waiting. So if somebody asks and they say, oh, I'm using that, you can have it when I'm done. Um, they can like turn the stand time over, they can wait, and then the other person gets a turn. Um, and then another one is saying, please stop. Some of those shy, quiet kids, um, or even a kiddo maybe who's having their, um, somebody's bothering them, they may be, be so overwhelmed with such big feelings, they may not know the language or what to do in that moment. So you can say, if someone's bothering you or if someone's doing something that you don't like, tell them, please stop. And then you'll see them using that in the classroom. You'll see their friends using it. And then say, what do you do when somebody tells you to please stop? Oh, you need to stop. Um, I have songs to go along with this. We also practice doing this with um, puppets. I have puppets right under here. Um, I have them and they say, oh, I'll say, okay, can you practice with your puppets? Tell your friend, please stop. And then their friend says, okay, I'll stop. So you have the one friend practice the doing the problem solving technique and then the other pr person practices what to do. Um, they could maybe practice ask, can I have a dinosaur? Okay, and they can pretend to take it and then they can play. Or, um, But puppets are great too for kiddos who are shy, so they're not having to say anything. Sometimes when they have a little animal, they can pretend to be that person. So then they'll um, they'll be more likely. They won't hopefully be as shy. Or maybe they can even whisper it, can I have one? Um, or they can just do it out to their friends or out to the class. Or you can be that person's buddy. Um, but just giving them a puppet kind of... Um, helps them just um, participate in this activity. But I have songs to go with it. Um, we practice it and then you also, and this goes for any visual, you wanna teach them what the visual means. So I'll say, okay, when we follow directions, we, we do steps one, two, three, you gotta do it. The, um, when you follow directions, you gotta do it in order like, um, like, like I say, right? Um, so that's why there's numbers. On this one, it says use material safely because we want to make sure no one gets hurt. That's why there's a heart. Um, so we can say, okay, this boy has all the toys. What is that boy going to do? Oh, he needs to ask. So teach what the visuals mean. So that way when they come over here to the um, problem solving solution chart, um, they can um, read the pictures. Um, I also have one of these that has all of my problem solving solutions on here. Because when I'm teaching this, that's when I wear this little guy. Um, and I only have the ones on here that I need. So that way, if there is two kiddos are having a problem in the block area, I don't have to stop them, move their bodies all the way over. I can just walk over there and say, oh, you're having a problem? What's the problem? You have them tell, us, tell you what's wrong, right? State the problem. And then I go through and I help them go through all the steps. So I'll say, oh, would ask, can you ask them? Can I have a block? Oh, okay, you try it. Oh, can I have that block? I'm using it right now. Of course, that's what the other kid's gonna say. And then they're going to go, okay, so ask didn't work because he still is playing with it. Can we play with someone new? Do you want to do that while you're waiting? Oh, you want to go play with someone new? Okay. Or maybe he says that doesn't work. And then you say, like, how you feel. And then there's one that says, um, there's one I had says get a timer. Um, I didn't, I guess I didn't use it the year I laminated this. But um, usually when you go for ask, you can also pair the timer with it. Or I have one that has the timer on it. Um, so yeah, so you can teach them what to do. And then later, once they have all the problem solving routines down, um, and I say later, meaning like a, like a month, once you've implemented this, you can have them say, okay, you have a problem. Do you guys want to go to the problem solving solution sign to, to walk over there and solve that problem together? And I have this in our safe place. And if you want to know more about the safe place, cause you need one of those in your classroom too, I have a whole Facebook live on it and, um, a whole blog post. And again, Links are in the handout, <laughs> um, so grab that. Um, so yeah, so that way the um, safe place is also a place kids can go to solve problems, and then you can have puppets there, and they can figure out a way to solve their problem. Are you going to walk right behind them to make sure that they are successful solving their problem? Absolutely, because what happens when kids have a problem? They have huge emotions, right? And again, our kiddos have not seen... <laughs> um, they haven't been out in the community. They haven't seen their families solve problems. They haven't been like, oh, man, they're out of bananas. They were out of bananas when I went to Target the other night. Crazy, right? I was like, oh, man, they're out of bananas. What am I going to do? Oh, oh, I think I'm just going to get some apples instead. Like you, 
kiddos have not seen their families or whoever their caregiver is, um, like model solving problems, hopefully in a positive way. Um, so we need to do that in our classroom and teach them these techniques. Now, that was probably really fast. So I have a whole hour long Facebook Live all about how to implement and teach and use problem solving solutions in your classroom. And I have a blog post about it. Um, and you can grab this in TPT and it has all the directions. Um, so yeah, so that is in there if you want more details on that. Um, and then I also, I also model it in the classroom. I also model how to solve problems. So I'll maybe like, um, maybe I'll be like, oh man, my favorite blue marker, it's all out of ink. Oh, I'm so frustrated. And so that way kids see that you have big feelings too, but then you're going to model how to manage them. Say, oh, I'm so frustrated with my favorite blue marker. What am I going to do? Um, like, and I'll say, oh, well, please stop. Will that, will that make my marker work? No. Ask, oh, what can I do? Like, I, I need another blue marker. What can I do? And maybe a friend says, oh, I know where the other expo markers are. Like, I can go find you a blue one, Miss Jackie. And then I'll say, oh, my gosh, that's such a great way to solve my problem. I asked, or really, what did I do? I got help, right? I asked my friend for help, um, or my my kiddo for help. <laughs> um, so I say, oh, my gosh, I asked my friend for help, and they helped me find a new blue marker because these kiddos are having huge feelings. And a lot of times they they don't know how to communicate those feelings, right? So we have to teach them ways to manage those huge emotions they have on the, on the inside, right? Like they don't want to, and they really want that dinosaur. And what are they going to do if they don't get it? They're going to kick and they're going to throw a tantrum, right? Because they don't know what to do with these feelings they have on the inside. Or maybe they don't want to do table time because, you know, maybe they're tired or they're sleepy um, and now these emotions that were really small yesterday are really, really big today because they're tired. Um, so now we, it's just our jobs to teach them how to manage those big emotions and problem solving solutions. If they have these in their pocket, if they have these in their brain and they have this, these techniques on how to solve their own problems and be independent um, or all the visuals um, that they can do when they, when they are stuck and they don't know what to do, um, all of these things are now like in their pocket and they can pull that out when they need it and they can help manage these big emotions. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about cleanup. Now I am going to do a Facebook live all about cleanup. So I'm going to kind of run through these really quick, but I know, and I have a whole um, Facebook live on cleanup too, if you need that um, in, in case you need it right now. <laughs> um, so cleanup again, this is huge. Having your labels on the tubs and on the shelf. Um, my biggest thing is observe your kiddos during centers. So if you see the blocks is a hot mess or pretend is a hot mess, right? There's food and, and this happens, it's happened in my classroom all the time. There would be food all over the floor and it was only 10 minutes into centers. So I would walk over there and be like, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff on the ground. Let's clean this up, up off the ground. So that way we can walk safely and you can have more fun playing because you won't have to be walking over all of this mess. So as you're having center time, walk over and help your kids manage and notice when they need to clean up before it's actually cleanup time, right? Because kiddos switch centers or maybe kiddos are, a lot of kiddos this year are wandering, right? They go from the center and then they wander over here and then they wander over there, which is actually the first stage in play is wandering or um, like center time. Um, so they're going to wander. So teach them to clean up kind of as they go. Um, cause we do that as adults, right? Like if, if, if we're cooking and it gets to be too big of a mess, we kind of clean up some of the things. So we have room to do what we need to do. So kind of teach them that, right? Oh my gosh, these blocks, these are all on the ground. These are in your way. Like, isn't it hard to build? Let, let's put these away. So that way we have more room to build your building. Um, so do that during centers, because then if you clean up, if they kind of clean up throughout center time, there won't be this huge, huge mess at the end. And it, so then it's unmanageable. Um, my other big trick is to use a fun, fast tempo cleanup song during um, cleanup. I know we want to use like the cleanup, blah, 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 like, like the song, which is it's fine if you use that. But just try using like a kid's bop song or some song that they love that's about three to five minutes um, and that has a fast tempo that they can sing to and that is a ton of fun. And what you will see is kids will kind of clean up to the beat. So if you have a faster beat, they'll be cleaning it faster. If it's slow, 
they'll be cleaning up slower. Um, and then, so they turn that song on. And obviously too, before you always want to go around with your five minute warning and say, oh, we have five more minutes to play. We have five more minutes to play. So that way they can mentally prepare for um, cleanup time that's coming. And that's when you can, um, I'll tell you what, that other thing in like a little minute. Um, but use a fun kids bop song. Obviously listen to it before you play it for your class. Use your kids bop song. And then what you want to do, this was my rule in my classroom. Um, and it just kind of helped build a community. If you're done in your center and you're all done cleaning up, go find a friend and help them clean up because sometimes our friends make messes and they're really big and you would want help if you had a big mess. So that was my always, that was always my rule is if, oh, your, your friend is cleaning up in library. Oh, can you go help in the block center? So instead of having four people in the block center, you now have eight people cleaning up in the block center or six. Um, instead of having two people cleaning up and pretend in that huge mess, you now have four people cleaning up. And then slowly all your centers get cleaned up because your kids, it's just you model helping each other. It's kind of like an unspoken part of your day. It's part of the routine that when you're, once you're done cleaning up, you get to go help your friend um, in another center. And then also when they see friends come to help, what does it do to their anxiety, right? It, it brings it down because they know they have help um, and they know that now they don't have to clean up this mess all by themselves. So you're not going to see as many behaviors during cleanup because everyone's going to be helping each other. And then once everything is cleaned up and if there's still time left in our song, um, they, everybody just comes to the carpet and we dance and we have fun. And that also does um, gets them moving and grooving and using all those um, gross motor movements and getting some sensory input in before you do the next activity. So it's kind of a twofer, right? It's a natural reward. They get to dance and have fun um, since they got everything cleaned up. So you don't have to give them a sticker or anything. Um, don't have to give them like a piece of candy because they cleaned up. They cleaned up and now they get to dance and that's the reward. And then we get to move on with the next part of our day. And they got in a lot of movement and sensory input. So now they can, their bodies will be calmer for the next activity. Um, one other thing I do is, like I said, I use the five-minute timer. I always make this a job. So the kids walk around and say, five more minutes to play, five more minutes to play. So they can then mentally prepare that, okay, like time is almost up. I need to kind of wrap up what I'm doing. Because as adults, we often like need to know, right? Like we do better when... We know like, oh, I got to wrap up my project. I'm on, you know, I got to leave in a minute. Um, it, it's kind of like the same for kids, right? They need to know that, okay, this is almost done. It's coming to an end. What do I need to do so I can wrap up the last thing that I'm doing? So it's not a surprise because if you surprise them and tell them it's cleanup, all of a sudden they're going to have huge emotions, which means they're going to have huge behavior problems. Okay, so five minute warning, use a fun cleanup song. And then also, and this makes a big difference, guys, if you are helping during cleanup, like before the beginning of the day, make sure all of your stuff is prepped. Obviously, if there's an emergency, it's not going to happen. Um, but typically, you want to have your small group ready, everything ready for the day before the kids come in, right? Um, so that way, when it is cleanup time, guess what you're doing? You're walking around, you're praising kiddos, you're giving kids choices when needed, you're helping kids before they have a, um, before their anxiety gets bigger. So you're helping clean up and you're modeling that behavior. And then too, if a kiddo is struggling during cleanup time, you can see that and you can say, oh, you know what? That looks like a really big mess. That looks really overwhelming. Can I help you with that? Um, do you wanna clean up the red blocks or the blue blocks? Do you wanna clean up the food or the, um, the, the plates and cups? Oh, you're going to clean up the plates? Okay, I'll clean up all the food. Um, so that way you can kind of give them choices and help. So that way, if a kiddo's anxious, we want to see that, right? So that way when they're anxious, we can help them and we can make that anxiety go down rather than, oh my gosh, like you're prepping, grabbing all the things and prepping or cutting out something for a small group. This kiddo who's anxious is anxious, but guess what's happening? Their, their anxious level is going to get higher and higher and higher until they explode. So we want to catch them when they're anxious. So that way we can help them help them calm down so there won't be big behaviors. So make sure you are cleaning up during cleanup time. And I also, I have the visuals. I have a cleanup routine visual. I have social stories all on TPT. So you can grab those if you need them. And then another thing is, 
your lessons and your activities. I've seen some people tell me in the comments that they're struggling with small group or they're struggling with circle time. Um, so I'm going to tell you some ideas for that. I know this Facebook Live is a little bit longer than normal, but I want to fit all kinds of goodness in for you guys. And again, all of this is in the handout too. Um, just kind of with cleanup, you want to have everything ready to go. So um, whether you come in a little bit early or you use your prep time or you stay a little bit late, have everything ready to go. That way you're not prepping during um, cleanup. You don't have to leave circle and go grab something. Obviously, if you forget something, like it's going to happen. But try and avoid that as much as possible. Like for um, circle type behind here, I have a little, a little crate. I don't know if you can see it. And it is just a little milk crate and it's sitting sideways and it has all the things that I use during circle, like post-it notes and markers. And um, I have different letter cards and different, I have like, um, like name cards and different things like that. All the things that I use during circle. I have puppets under here too. I have clipboards in case we're doing something during circle. I have little buckets of markers. So if we need markers during circle time, um, maybe they're going to do like a, like a letter hunt at the end of circle time. I have the clipboards right here. I have markers right here. So that way everything is right here. I don't have to get up and go get anything. Um, so everything is like ready to go. And then you also want to know your kids and assess your kids, whatever assessment system you have. Maybe use my assessments. Um, maybe use the schools that you're provided with. Um, but know what level your kiddos are at. So that way you're planning activities that are at their level. They're not too hard and they're not too low. They're right um, kind of in that sweet spot. And if you have to differentiate, you can. Um, like maybe some kiddos are going to use a color dice. Maybe some kiddos are going to use a number dice with numbers one through three on them. Maybe some kiddos are going to use a dice with numbers one through six. So that way they're all playing the same game, um, but they're all playing at their own level. So everyone is challenged, but no one is frustrated. Um, so you can differentiate when you need to. Um, also think about, is the length appropriate? And is especially this year. If your circle time is 20 minutes and you're teaching pre-K, it's probably too long. Um, usually I, I would start the year in pre-K at like a 10, 11 minute circle. And then I would slowly, because I had a mix of three, four and five year olds, I would slowly make the circle longer as the year went, as their attendance span grew. Um, but if you need two, if you need a 20 minute circle, break it up. So I always had two circles. Um, every day I had one like a before centers, and then I had one later in the day, or you can do one after centers, just depending on how it worked. So that way I could break it up. So that way they're attending the whole time. They're not getting bored. They're not um, doing attention seeking behaviors or they're not having behavior problems because they literally can't attend that long. So if they can't do something, then um, break it up. And you can also read your kiddos. Like if they're struggling that day, um, Maybe cut your circle short. Maybe say, you know what, I'm going to save this and I'm going to do it later. Um, I um, I put my calendar time, like my linear calendar. I always do. I always I took that out of my regular circle time. And I did that at the beginning of music and movement. because That's how we started our day. Um, so I took calendar time completely out. So that way it was added into music and movement time. So now my circle time, I could focus on a book the whole time and whatever little activity I had. Um, with that. So I had two circles in my day. I had um, a calendar during music and movement. So that gave me multiple times to teach whole group, but it was all different times and it was broken up to where um, it was a, it was a, a blah, blah, blah. it was an appropriate length of time for the kiddos that were um, that I was teaching. If you are a big weather person and you want to do weather, maybe sneak that in and have your weather chart at the lot at the door. Um, so you can say, okay, we're going to go outside and what's the weather today? What was it like when you came inside? Put your weather chart on your door. Nothing. It doesn't say anywhere in any book that says you have to do weather during circle time. It doesn't. So change it. Do the weather as you guys are lining up to go out the door and say, oh, you guys needed your coat today? Oh, it must be a little chilly. What season do you think we're in? Um, have those visuals on your door. It is totally okay. Um, do what your kiddos need that year. And then maybe when they have low, a longer attendance span, put your weather back in during your circle time. Um, you do what works for you. Um, what else? Oh, is it, um, are your, are your lessons or your small group, um, 
lesson, like, so when I say lessons and activities, I mean like circle time, table time, small group. Um, are your activities open-ended and appropriate? Are you doing an art activity that isn't going to work for a three-year-old? If you are teaching kinder, are you doing an activity that's appropriate for kinder? Like, is your activity open-ended um, and appropriate? You don't, again, you don't want to do something that's too hard or too easy. Is it open-ended? Can they have fun and create and have there be no um, perfect product they have to do? Um, can you make it more fun? How can you make it more engaging? How can you add sensory to it? Can you put the letter card or letter puzzle pieces in a little, little mini sensory bin? Maybe something like small like this. Um, can you um, add movement circle? I have a whole small group and um, I have a whole, a whole small group. I have a whole Facebook live and blog post on read aloud ideas so you can make it more interactive and more fun with your kiddos and how you can add movement. So if you are struggling with small group, if you're struggling with, with um, centers or not centers, small group, circle, um, just think about how can you change it? Can you make it shorter? How can you um, add more sensory, add more movement, um, make it more open-ended? Um, just so your kiddos can be successful. Because if it's if you're having behavior problems, unless it's unless it's a kiddo that's on like a behavior plan, um, but for your typical kiddos, if, if a lot of them are struggling, then maybe you just need to kind of dial it back a little bit or add sensory, add movement, make it more engaging. Um, if you're doing a letter sort, I always love doing letter sorts during small group, but instead of having the kiddos like do it at their seat, I put the letters kind of in like an oval around the table and that way everybody is literally up and they're walking and they are putting the, the letter, the magnet letters or the letter manipulatives or the letter cards, whatever they were, they were literally walking around and matching those letters. So now they're moving and doing the letter activity. So you get movement in and you're getting um, a really engaging activity. So because you'll be able to do it longer if they're moving. So more engaged, fun, just by adding that little piece of movement. So just look at your lesson plans and see how you can like tweak them a little bit um, or add or take away. Um, so yeah, and then look at those schedules to make sure everything is the appropriate length. See if you need to kind of change your schedule up a little bit. And I do have a whole blog post on things you need to think about um, when you're making your um, schedule. And I have a schedule. I had the schedule I used when I taught half day. And then I have the schedule I used when I taught full day because I've, I've taught both. When I taught full day, I had 18 kiddos. So well, I always had an, um, an, a teacher buddy with me though. So, which was needed because <laughs> 18 kids is a lot. Um, so yeah. And then I didn't talk about safe place, but I have a whole blog post and a whole Facebook live all about safe place too. So I know this year's hard. I know it's it's different. The kiddos are different, but you know what? You guys can do this. Your kiddos need you. Just think about all those little amazing moments throughout the day when they're smiling and they get it. And it's all those little aha moments or a circle time goes really well. Hold on to those moments when it gets hard and just take the time to teach them, whether it be problem solving techniques or um, class expectations or routines. I also have a feeling pack in my TPT store. So maybe you need to teach, um, sneak in some emotions because at circle time, you can always talk about how is that character feeling? Oh my gosh, she had a problem. Like what could she do? Did she stomp her feet? No, that would be a red choice. What did she do? What was the green choice she made? You can notice green choices and, um, positive behavior examples in any book, even if the character is an animal. They are always making a choice. So what I want you guys to do is at the top of this post, there's a handout um, in the blog post. I hope you, I hope this helped you guys. I know this year is hard. We can do it. You guys are amazing. Your kiddos will be so much. Everything will come together. It just beginning of the year is hard. This year is hard like no other. So just think about how all these things you're doing, even though they're hard, just think about how your classroom will be in like a month. Think about how much easier it is already from the beginning of school, how much their behaviors have changed and how much they've grown. And the more they grow socially and academically, the more um, the more amazing things you're going to see, the more problem solving you're going to see. You're going to see them helping each other with problems more. You're going to see more of classroom community. And once all those things happen, it's like you can breathe again, right? So let's get Let's get, 
Let's get it. And I know you guys can do it. And I hope you guys have an awesome day. Talk to you guys later.